Okay, welcome to the August 24th weekly Jupiter Lab call. Today we have 15 people on the call. And please find the agenda linked in the chat. Uh, please feel free to add your name if you would like. Uh, please feel free to add a, an update to the agenda section. And if there's something you'd like to talk about that's going to take more than, say, five minutes, please add it at the bottom in the additional discussion section. I can tell you right now, it does not look like we're going to be suffering for time to discuss everything on this agenda because it's looking rather light. But um, why don't we get started with Fred, who is first on the agenda today. It's just to help you not being the first. <laughs> uh, the, I have three PRs that are in need for review. So if people have some time, so we appreciate some review. Um, first one is small, is to try to increase some uh, coverage for translation. Uh, the second one is uh, features that was implemented by Jessica, if I'm correct, but was reverted because of some side effects. So the idea is to uh, to prompt the user uh, for renaming uh, the unti untitled files uh, when the user is saving the files the first time manually. Um, I took the chance also to add or to address another issue that's uh, streaming dialogue, uh, meaning that uh, is to add the ability of having a kind of checkbox in the dialogue uh, that you can, uh, for example, uh, use for saying, don't show me again this dialogue. And you can use the, the result from the dialogue to get the value of the dialogue, but also the value of the checkbox to decide what to do with it. Um, and the last one is the new extension manager. So uh, I've already done some modification following review. And so I'm like waiting for a, a final review of that one. Uh, and following some question on Gitter, a nice side effect of the new extension manager is that there isn't, there's going to be no new read-only managers that a user can use. Uh, and the read-only manager will allow the people to list all extensions that are uh, available and we'll be able to disable or enable it, but without the ability of installing any new extension. So it's it's a bit like what you get in the NB extension configurators for the classical notebook in which uh, all extensions are with checkbox that you can check and uncheck and then re refresh the page. And that's oh. it for the first one, but yeah. I had a, just for the um, the uh, checkbox for don't ask me again. Uh, so I assume that that's like opt-in for all the dialog boxes you want to use. I, did you only add it for this dialog box or did you like do a review for other dialog boxes or is that like a good follow-up to figure out which dialog boxes to add this option to? So I added to the show dialog and I propagated the option to the input dialog because I'm actually using a, a get text dialog for the, the name. Right, but will it always be there for input dialogs? Is that what you're saying? Or do you have to opt in in the code no, for no, each? It's, it, uh, it's, a, it's an opt-in. If you don't specify anything, then nothing will show up in the dialog. Right, but so is there any places where we this PR will opt in as well? Um, because I think been... there are... Oh, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say that there are a few dialogues in Jupyter Lab which could benefit from having this turn on. So I, I don't know if you looked at that for this PR or whether that's better for a follow-up PR. Yeah, I would say for a follow-up PR, but I definitely agree there are, there are a couple of existing dialogues that could benefit from it, like uh, should, do you want to shut down or do you want to restart, confirm, and stuff like sure, that. Sure, sure. Yeah, definitely agree. That's also why it's in that issue that um, that I agree it's, it's, it would be fixed by this PR, but uh, there's definitely a clear follow-up. Other than that, um, once you click, um, remember what's the, um, if you want to have it uh, forget, 
it is remembers how do, what you need to do. So I went for the the idea of not doing things in the dialog. So basically, you get a new. So in uh, in the result object that you get, so you have the value, the button that is uh, clicked, and so uh, you have a new is checked. There is null if there is no checkbox or that has the status of the checkbox. Right, but so what I mean is if um, oh I see you in your gift that you. In, in this specific case, then I'm using that for updating the settings. Oh, so you need, so the, the memory is stored in a setting somewhere. Yeah, so that the user can any times go back to the advanced settings editor to right, re, so... reactivate the feature. Yeah, exactly. That was, that was what I was trying to ask, that it's, this is something that you would go into the settings editor to, to undo the remembering. Yeah. All right, good. But I didn't enforce that to be part of the feature in the dialog so that if people want to do another another action depending on the tech checkbox state, then they can. Um, sure. sure. I just, uh, yeah, the, the worst case scenario is that if it's remembering some information then you cannot clear that memory somehow without, you know, going to delete all your settings folders and then searching for it so as long as it's documented how to clear it out if if everything goes wrong with it that's that's okay yeah maybe when we get the notification we could even like trigger some pop-up saying like you have undo that settings do you are you sure <laughs> but that may be too much noise <laughs> now nah, as long as they can find it by googling it that should be sufficient We had a request for a demo of the extension manager if you have it running and if that's possible. No pressure if you don't. Uh, let's say I'm looking to it and uh, uh, at the end of the call or something like that, <laughs> I need to to change branches and uh, rebuild, but I can do it definitely. Cool. Uh, um, any volunteers to review the three PRs? Remember, number one is easy. Yeah, they are uh, roughly from easiness to toughest in the sense that the size of it. <laughs> um, Vidar, would you be willing to review the extension manager? Uh, uh, no, my, my open source time is completely filled up with hyper-weighted stuff this, okay. this coming week, so. I, I... Um, the reason I singled out Vidar is because he worked on extension manager, not because I wanted to be mean. <laughs> um, no, no, I, I understood it. I, and I want to review it. I just don't have the time to, to give it a, a proper review. Yeah, fair. Um, again, the agenda is light, so I can wait uncomfortably to see if anyone volunteers to review. I can or, look at one of these issues depending on how others pick up. Cool. Um, please, could you look at the second one? Sure, I can take that. Awesome, thank you. Piyush volunteers. Okay. Um, and then sure. the other thing are more information. So I still have two big ones that are I'm reviewing or finishing up. Uh, it's the fin the the takeover of the PR of Kevin about removing model DB. So everything is green except memory leak. So when we test creating a notebook and uh, deleting the notebook, then the notebook object is still in memory. So I removed that a couple of weeks ago. So I don't want a PR to uh, to the, to uh, to undo that or to to come back to some memory leak so and i'm fighting to figure out what's going on um, but uh, eventually I, I will find that and then um, uh, i'm fighting with also the rebase of the windowing of the notebook because uh, now there is the ls or part of the lsp uh, features that uh, are in core and so uh, i need to uh, rethink a bit more some part of the lsp api the reason for that is uh, if a notebook is uh, is virtual or windowed, 
uh, you have the editors only for the cells that has been in uh, viewport and up to now it was not the case so the lsp extension is making the assumption that they can request the editors for every cells of the notebook Eva. and so i need to yeah change that a bit so it's gonna take some time and the so and those two are important for v4 that's why i'm mentioning that here um and the last thing is just to mention so next week is our sci uh we have a poster for uh, presenting features of jupyter app 4 and notebook 7 and there's gonna be plenty of talk about uh, uh python in the browser so there's gonna be one by jeremy and i think torsten of Jup on jupyter light night there's gonna be another one about biodi by the the authors of them and one about PyScript. so that's very trendy and that's cool that we are part of that trend. Cool. Um, I just linked the uh, model DB and virtual notebook PRs in there in case people are interested in taking a look and trying to help with the memory leak issue or with reviewing of the virtual notebook PR. Um, Okay, any questions, comments for Fred? Cool. Um, again, I will exhort you, if there's anything you wanna talk about, please add something to the agenda because right now it's only me remaining. Uh, I have been working on Lumino 2 and as of a few days ago, um, there is a set of Lumino 2 alphas out. So the last day or two, I've been working on the Jupyter Lab 4 Lumino migration. It is ready for review. And um, please take a look because even if you don't want to do a review, you might still benefit from just seeing what sort of changes are coming. Lumino 2 has a um, migration guide that we're working on as we change things. So uh, let me actually link that migration guide as well. So that gives a partial basis, but A, this guide is in flux and B, it's not complete yet. It's just more so we don't forget. Where is the um, minute? Oh, here we go. So let me link that in the meeting minutes as well. So Lumino 2 migration guide, partial. And um, I guess I can go through some of what's different because it's um, it's a fairly big PR, but actually a lot of it is the same concepts over and over. So there are two pretty commonly used functions in Lumino that are both deprecated, although one of them is deprecated only in a PR. Uh, one function is to array, which we use in a lot of places. And the other function is each, which helps you loop over an iterable. To array is um, deprecated because a native function exists array.from that can take any iterable and turn it into an array. So we, strictly speaking, don't need it. Um, but I would also, if you look at the migration guide, I would also recommend not really using array.from unless you truly need it. There are some places where you actually need to exhaust the contents of an iterator because you're serializing it or you're converting it to JSON or you need some array method or, you know, there's lots of reasons, but there's plenty of other reasons, plenty of other cases rather, where you can just iterate through the object itself without converting it to an array. So if you look both at Lumino and at the lab PR, you'll see most places where two array existed haven't been replaced with array.from, they've just been removed. The other one is each, 
which lots of um, helper libraries, prototype, low dash, jQuery, they have something like this. Um, but now that iterators and iterables are native and there's a native for of loop where you can say for X of some iterable, whether that iterable is an array, a map, a set, or some custom thing that you created, uh, because that for loop is now native, it just really takes most of the use cases away. You rarely need to use each to loop through something. Um, and by rarely, I mean pretty much never, because um, it won't make your code shorter, really than the same for loop. Um, arrays already have a for each built in. And um, yeah, so I mean, anyway, take, 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 take a look if you're curious or if you want to do a review of this or if you're just looking to see how your own extension is going to um, need to change to be compatible with Lumino 2. It shouldn't be a huge change for you. like all of Jupyter Lab with however many uh, packages it has and, and the the PR is on the, what is this? Uh, the PR is about on the order of like 12, 1300 changes. So that's pretty small in the grand scheme of things. And many of those are just package JSON updates. Um, the other big change in Lumino 2 is that, or oh, one other big change in Lumino 2 is that the data store package is gone. Um, but I don't think that really affects anyone. People weren't using it. That was our CRDT implementation. And now that Jupyter's RTC story is based on YJS, we're not using that anymore. Um, there's a lot of other smaller changes you could look at. I've also linked to the Lumino 2 project. You can look at what issues have been completed and what issues are still outstanding. Uh, thanks to Fred and Piyush and Gabriel, among others, who are working on this. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I really have to say about that. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Cool. All right. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Fred. Uh, so then, you are up. Uh, yeah, I just added a small item. So as you know, there, there has been a pre-release of Lab 4 with Code Mirror 6. And there are quite a few extensions that will probably require some significant changes to work with JupyterLab 4 and Code Mirror 6, one of which is LSP. Uh, as we all know, I mean, we've discussed this before, but the other one that we had not thought of earlier is JupyterLab Git, because there is currently no merge view plugin for Code Mirror 6, so we'll have to make one. Um, yeah, uh, we have similar issues for features that we actually dropped when we upgraded to Code Mirror 6. For example, we don't have latex syntax highlighting. So if people feel like making a, some kind of latex parsing for JupyterLab or Code Mirror 6, uh, they should you know, uh, manifest themselves and because I think there is significant work there. So yeah, that's it. Cool, thanks a lot. Um, I actually did think of one other thing. I brought it up last week as well, I'll bring it up again. And that is that if you are on the Jupyter Lab Council and you would like to nominate someone else for the council, please do. If you would like to nominate someone to be our software steering council representative for this project, please do. We are trying to ramp up the new governance quickly. Um, we have um, an intermediate deadline in October for the sub projects to all have reasonably representative councils. I think Jupyter Lab is pretty close. I mean, I it was just counting how many people on this call are in the council and how many people are on this call, and it's 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 not the um, it's not I think 
complete yet. We should probably have some more, but um, we're pretty close. As far as the Software Steering Council goes, that body doesn't exist yet, but what it will be is a regular meeting with representatives from every Jupiter sub project and some of the working groups and standing committees where cross project things um, that have implications on someone else's project are discussed. Sometimes they might need to be voted on. Usually it's probably just discussion. And um, JEPs are voted on by this body. Uh, that's stupid enhancement proposals. And uh, you don't need any additional qualification to be a representative for a project than you do just to be a voting member of that project on that project's council. It's not meant for like that project's mini BDFL or its technical leader or anything like that. In fact, many projects don't have any such person. And so, um, the idea isn't that this is the person in charge of the sub project. It's that this person represents the sub project and knows it reasonably well so that they can um, have discussions with other Jupiter sub projects about the areas where they overlap. Jason Grout pasted in the chat. Um, the section of governance that uh, we worked on last week that describes the Software Steering Council representatives and says roughly what I just said, but probably in better language because we thought about it longer in that call. Um, yeah, any questions about that? I have one question. Well, yeah, I guess it's a question for the group here or really a question for the council maybe. Um, the nomination process uh, for the SSC representative, I think I would prefer for us to have an open call for nominations and a private submission process so that uh, if someone nominates somebody, it doesn't intimidate other people from nominating a different person. Does that make sense? Or at least at, at least that there's a deadline by which people are nominated. So it's not like the first person nominated is, okay, let's vote. Okay, great. Um, so that we can have some choice. So that's a good idea. Um, the deadline seems really easy because no one has to do it. The, um, the nomination not being open means someone's got to receive those nominations. Right. Um, anyone want to volunteer it. Well, to receive them? <laughs> I mean, what we can do is just set up like a Google form uh, and then on the deadline date, we just open up the Google form. Though I agree that it makes sense for someone to sort of manage that process. But it can be a lightweight process is what I'm saying. Hi. Just create a Google form on the deadline date, copy those things in an email to the council saying, okay, here's our nominations. Sure. I can do that, you should. Yeah, please, thank you. Um, those both sound like good ideas. What's a good time frame, do you think? When should that deadline be? What was our tentative deadline for picking an SSC representative? October? Um, I think it was like first or second week of October. So the third day of October is what we had on that spreadsheet. When we were discussing this in, although I think that's a typo because, because third, day many, third week. Well, it just says three October twenty two. Well, oh, it's a sub project council. I'm seeing sub project councils form third of October. Sub projects pick software steering council reps third of October. So I don't think that's a typo. I think that's a choice. All right. So why don't we say give people. So votes only take a week, right? Um, so if we gave people a whole month from today, that still gives us a week to do the vote. Um, and that's quite a long time to do nominations. 
we might even decide that's too long. Maybe we say September 15th or something. If you want to nominate someone for the Software Steering Council to represent Jupiter Lab, do it by September 15th. Is um, that okay? I think, I think it's fine to make it a month from today because remember the council might be growing and the council sure. might include people that are nominated or want to make a nomination. So I think it's fine okay. to say a week before our deadline is the deadline and then we hold the vote and then October 3rd, we have our representative. Okay. Anyone have an objection to that? Are we on board for doing this? I'm going to take no objections to mean consensus in this particular context. Um, this probably should be sent in an email to the council. Uh, yeah. I, I, many I of so. whom are here, but but the like official decisions from the council. Sure. Um, any other questions, comments about this? Okay. We have two items in additional discussion. I don't think they're actually meant for discussion, but we may as well go over them. Uh, who added the IPI widgets one? Was that you, Jason? Yeah, I would like to make a quick note just because we discovered a problem after we released. So IPI widgets eight was released last Thursday. This is the culmination of years of effort. Um, so hurrah. Um, we, uh, the change log is, is listed here. We are releasing some patch releases that are uh, addressing issues that people are, are coming up. But one of the first things that, we, one of the first patch releases we did uh, for IPI widget seven is we realized that IPI widget seven did not appropriately cap the dependency on Jupyter Lab widgets. So if you install IPI widget seven now, well, if you installed it before, before we released the patch release to 7.7.2 or 7.6.6, .6, then you would end up with IPI widget seven Python package, but JupyterLab widgets eight uh, JupyterLab extension package, and those weren't compatible. And so there were some problems with that. So just FYI, if you're using IPI widget seven and all of a sudden things broke since last Thursday, uh, it may be that your JupyterLab underscore widgets package is the IPI widgets 8 compatible version. Uh, so you can either pin your version of JupyterLab underscore widgets uh, or upgrade to IPI widgets 7.7.2 or 7.6.6, .6, which fixes this dependency issue. So a bit subtle, but if you notice problems since last Thursday uh, with IPI widgets 7, you might check that. And that's all there. I think I actually saw this come up in the wild. So thanks for documenting it. Um, that was the first. That was the first time I looked at a change log in a while, and I'm like, I'm stoked. There's some cool features in this. <laughs> I'm excited to play with this. Awesome. Good to hear. Cool. And we have another discussion item, which I imagine Nicola added. Is that right? Yeah, I added, uh, I don't think the, there is no need for discussion, but just to notify that uh, NBGrader has been, has been uh, released this week. And uh, and now we are still working on the uh, compatibility with Notebook 7. That's that it. is awesome. Thank you so much. That's also years in the work, in the making. So that's awesome. So this NBGrader supports JupyterLab 3 and Notebook 6. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, it's right, but uh, it should support uh, Notebook Seven and uh, Jupyter Lab Four normally. Soon. Don't worry, we're going to make it easier for you by releasing new versions of every library it's built on top of for no good reason. No, no, that's not true. There's good reasons, but you know, it might be a little bit of work. Um. Okay. Great. Is there anything anyone wants to discuss before I stop the recording? And I can do the demo. What's up, Tony? Um, I was curious about in your Lumino 2.0 conversation. Um, one of the things I'd love to see is some explicit consideration for accessibility. And I wondered if stuff like 
ARIA standards or ARIA specs might be in scope for doing uh, enriching some of the rendering and some of the descriptors there. I don't know if there are hooks like that yet, but with all the work going on with accessibility that Frederic's been talking about and work at the Jupiter Lab Retro Lab level, I'm curious if Lumino has the glue that we might need to actually unify some of these efforts. Yeah, so this is something we've been thinking about and um, there's a few different answers to it, but before I fill up more time with my voice, I wonder if Gabriel wants to say anything about it. Uh, so <laughs> good, uh, not great timing because I'm, I'm currently in transit, but um, to, yeah, I, there's, I don't really know what to say about it other than like we we there's an issue that's currently open and being tracked in Lumino to specifically about accessibility and we've had conversations about it and we're looking into the code base to see if there's um you know opportunities with this upgrade to bring anything like to to put in to actually sort of like put in place anything that would be useful accessibility wise <clears throat> But that's all I can. That's all I can think of. Okay, I'll add on to that then. So uh, today uh, we merged a PR that Gabriel had opened that fixes uh, the fact that the luminal menus will capture your keyboard focus and tab and not let go, and that's been resolved. And uh, we had just a look at all the different packages, their sort of their API footprint and how you would approach making these components more accessible. And what the proximate thing we wanted to resolve was, are there gonna be backward incompatible API changes that will help us because now's the time for that. And it's a short window we have for that. And then the next question is, irrespective of whether they're backward incompatible or not, what sorts of things do we need to offer? So much of Lumino can be augmented to be more accessible in user land, right? Because it uses things like renderers and you could just give a better renderer that has these attributes. Some of it probably will benefit from receiving instantiation options that applies things for you instead of you having to do it after the fact. And so, um, but even, even those things can be added uh, or additive, right? They won't necessarily break backward compatibility. So some of the pressure to get a whole bunch of fixes in right away is a little less than I initially feared. Uh, however, uh, it's definitely a really good time to be looking at these components because they're the building blocks of lab and notebook. And so improving them out of the box just helps everyone. Um, I think uh, one problem we have is that so few people in the project work on Lumino, they work on lots of other aspects. So part of what I personally am trying to do is to get more people engaged and to try to tell them what I know about it so that it's not just contained in the heads of a few people who worked on it five years ago. Um, Mike linked to an issue that is just part of the Lumino 2 um, project, which is specifically about this. And um, it's a it's a good sort of place to not quite treat as a wish list, but you know, a good place to track some of the things that need to go in and maybe spawn actual issues off of individually. Um, yeah, I don't know. Does that sort of give you a basis for next steps? Is there like, is there is there some aspect of it we could talk about that would that would help? I, I think one thing I want to do is be more uh, present 
at the accessibility calls because not that many people, like I said, know Luminos. So showing up there and trying to solicit help and offering uh, uh, my own uh, knowledge of the packages might might be beneficial there. Uh, I mean, if you're around today, uh, maybe, and there's time, maybe we can continue some of that. Um, and uh, Gabriel, if you have some time, maybe we can catch up about it. Um, I mean, I don't know uh, Lumino all that well, but I think I've seen some of the rubs with like, there's some accessibility things that are like internal to the component. And then there are some accessibility things that are application specific, right? Like doing ARIA labels of say the notebook in different application, like the notebook widget in different applications might need to change. So maybe we can just like talk a little bit around like what are some of the things that are constant and some of the things that might need to change and it might help find a common ground. And thanks for this issue too. After that discussion, I'll be able to put together some words a little more. Cool, great. Um, okay, then why don't we go to demo time? Sure. <laughs> if there is no more point to discuss. Um, so at, the, at first, it doesn't change much. So this is the new panel. The, the main difference, let's say, for the look and feel is that uh, it's using the side panel with uh, a caution that's the same that the, the debugger for a bit more homogeneous look and feel. Um, and the back end is, uh, is done with PyPy. So, and everything is done through the back end. So, if I look for something here, and I should have open network, that's my fault. Oh. And I should look to all requests and not. Okay, so everything now is done uh, by asking the, the backend. So uh, we are, it's maybe a bit small. Uh, so we are asking the endpoint API with the query and uh, the server is responding with uh, what's the list of things. Of course, here I put something that was with one output. If I put more, I would get more output. Um, the the reason for doing that is to to be able to to have an API that's uh, pluggable, uh, meaning that uh, you can change the backend or the manager on the backend by uh, a thread, let, and uh, you can define and hook your own by uh, uh, just defining the API in a Python package and uh, defining an entry point for the your custom extension manager to be available. So for example, we can imagine to do one for using Conda. Um, the main trouble uh, I have to say is to be able to, to filter the, the list of available package to be meaningful. So for now, uh, when we are using PyPy, what we are tracking is all the extension that are, that have the classifier uh, JupyterLab and pre-built. Um, so that's bring a couple of limitation. Uh, one of them is that the extension itself can be incompatible with the current version of JupyterLab. So we'll see how to deal with that maybe later. Uh, another trouble also is to reconciliate the name of the, the extension in Python and the one in, um, uh, the one in uh, NPM. So I don't have it installed. But for example, uh, NB Dime, if you get it installed for uh, uh, its name, uh, I think is uh, JupyterLab NB Dime, and uh, it's missing the installed JSON file. So you cannot figure out what's the exact name of the Python package to uninstall it if you want to uninstall it from the uh, from the, the interface. So those those are the kind of limitation we, we have for now. Um, so that was the PyPy version. And if I just restart the server, I'm changing the, the, the manager to be the read-only one. 
So this one is with the read only. Yeah. So with the read only, what will happen is that you will be able to just uh, see what are the extension installed and you will be able to enable them or disable them, but you won't be able to, to install anything or search uh, some distant package repository. But at least you would be able to just say, okay, I want to disable like kernel spy. Uh, and then you are informed that you need to refresh. That's probably a follow up or a target for Jupyter Up 5 to be able to out reload some plugins. Uh, that would be nice. So if I check, normally it's deactivated. If I re enable it and refresh. And this is back. So most of the thing is, is not in the, the UI, it's more in the in the API that has completely changed. Um, so because also there there are that features that you can uh, whitelist or blacklist extensions. So that feature is still available, but everything is done in the back end before replying to the front end when you are asking for a list of extension. Um, so those features are still real, are available. They are just happening in another place. I don't know if people have questions. Yeah, there's a question in the chat from Mike saying, should we show the package manager name and installation path slash environment in the UI? Users might get a breaking environment change after installation. So we should be explicit about what action is being taken. Yes. Yeah. I need to come up with the API for that, but yeah, <laughs> because I'm trying also to keep in mind what what will what will be the the outlook if the manager is npm as it used to be. Uh, I didn't implement it because I think the pattern that we have now with pre-built extension is a better one. But but yeah, definitely I can I can do that and add that to the to the API of the manager. You should That's be it. able to distribute pre-built extensions via npm as well, of course, if you actually build it and include it in your test. Yeah, but the question is then, is, it, is there an, an easier way to install it? I mean, uh, that would be up to the manager to, to define what installed is meaning in that case. So maybe some just a metadata request about the installation method where or for pip you would show the sys prefix and say pip or and for npm you would show like the place for um for you know npm packages that would be installed as extensions and you know just maybe just a markdown file, you know, like something you can display. Nominally the install.json tries to record the information of where that extension came from. Uh, and the idea was you don't have to use pip to install it. You could just copy files there from wherever you find them on the internet. And so if we had some place to get the files, say a CDN that was showing uh, NPM packages or whatever, then your extension could just copy those files into the right directory and put an install.json there that indicated this was installed by the JupyterLab extension manager. Uh, so essentially, use the JupyterLab extension manager to uninstall it if you'd like. Okay. Thanks for all the ideas. Thanks for the demo. That's cool. Um, yeah. One thing that perennially comes up that we don't have a good answer for, but it's worth pitching to 16 people is ratings or reputation or, you know, like when, when, when you're in a different IDE whose name I won't say, you'll see that this thing has X number of stars and it would be beneficial to have the, 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 the sort of reassurance that, oh, this, this, this is super popular, so I'll use it too. Um, I wonder, 
like we're talking about something fairly lightweight, but something that we'd have to keep track of and we'd have to host and, it, you know, it's big. So Vidar has his hand up and Fred has his hand up. So go to Tom Vidar. Yes, today on topic first, the, there is a lot of work maintaining those kind of ranking systems and having hosting for it. And, you know, the moment you have a thing that calls out when you use it, I think the previous extension manager, right? It had something like that. Yeah, if you use this, it will you know, hit. It, it told you what you would do and it wasn't enabled by default, right? So if something is enabled by default and it hits a uh, uh, public internet endpoint, that's uh, not good, right? So it would something have to be something you opt into. But yeah, it's hosting and maintenance and making sure that nobody's trying to game it and all this stuff. Is um, if it can be crowdsources, crowdsourced, good. If it's uh, if not, and if it's then it's you know it's tricky. It would be probably hit quite a lot, right? So it would generate quite a bit of traffic. That's true. Also, just right. a side point for the install that Jason. But the experience for the previous thing was that if you need metadata for the extension manager to work, once the extension manager is out, people will start pestering extension authors to, to add this thing. So that, that that will come surprisingly quickly after it's been released. So it's it's, yeah. it's okay to to release it as it is and say like if you want these all these features make sure your extension has this file and then that will just be sorted. To be clear, the install that JSON is put in place by whoever installs the extension. So the idea is if it's included in the pit package or if the extension manager is installing extension, the extension manager is the one that writes that install that JSON. Fred, what are you thinking? Um, it was to to go back to the kind of popularity thing. There are a couple of services like this one that provides uh, a simplified API for the Google BigQuery table on PyPy, but most of them they are doing throttling for good reason. And so definitely uh, what Vidar was saying is the is true is if we really want to have that kind of download stat like on PyPy for the PyPy uh, manager, we would probably need to to kind of having a repository with bot that are just like creating those ranking that can be requested more heavily than those uh, services because those ones are not done for that. I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about something that a Raspberry Pi could serve, right? Because let's say there's 2000 extensions right? Put them in a SQLite database, hammer it as hard as you want, and you won't take down a Raspberry Pi. So like, it isn't actually, it, it's more the persistence and the hosting and all that other stuff that I think is hard, not the actual amount of data we're going to be sending this API. Jason, what do you think? Um, with the previous extension manager, when we confronted this curation and rating and store, you know, app store kind of question, uh, our first cut was uh, having two classes of extensions. One uh, that were uh, one was extensions that are published by the Project Jupiter, and so there was this you know icon of little Jupiter off to the corner, and that was an easy way to give people some level of judgment, at least what we stood behind in Project Jupiter, um, even without trying to solve the general like rate everybody's code in the world uh, kind of problem. Just just so to, that, to that was sorted by using the org, right? The NPM registry org, right? I think we, uh, that was an initial rough cut, but I think there was a hard coded list because there may be some stuff that's not in the org. Like uh, uh, the Jupyter widget. The codes there. Yeah. The Jupyter widget was manually added. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're familiar but, with it. But anyway, that's a rough cut of yeah. providing but, some curation. 
the, the, the thing is in the API of the reworked uh, PR I have opened, I kept this thing like uh, you can uh, add the metadata to the package thing, it's approved. But the question is from PyPy, I didn't figure out what could be a good way of saying, okay, this is an extension that by default we re-support because you cannot say like, if it started by JupyterLab, it's too easy to hack. <laughs> and as, <laughs> so, so the other possibility would be like, okay, if the home URL is like the GitHub JupyterLab organization, that may be a path, <laughs> but it's probably too easy to hack too because you probably can just fake the home URL of your package and that would, that we'd go through. So I, I don't know. <laughs> you could just hard code a list of packages. I mean, that's one way to do it. <laughs> or we host, as Darren was saying, we host our own small website in which we enforce which one we say we are like supporting. Could we, could we default to the enabling disabling thing? because it's at least not risky and like the other one which, for which we are like thinking of ways to curate the content could be more of an example yeah previously we had uh, the extension manager was behind a pretty large warning right because mm -hmm. like if you it, install something it, you will be running third-party code it's very dangerous i think that still applies it is, yeah. it is. I didn't remove that part. It's just because of the demo, I, I, I say I acknowledge, but the warning is still there. It's already, it's still all that right. part, that, that part is it, still there. If it starts in read-only mode and then the warning is for removing read-only mode, then at least the base level is more informative. And the warning is for when you actually take saying like, oh, I'm actually going to change stuff around and this is when you have the risk of executing code. Yeah, but I didn't win that way because the idea is to say that it's a server threatly configuration for admin. So if they enforce read-only, it should be read-only and nothing else. Um, since we have two minutes left on the call, I'm going to stop the recording tell people that there's an accessibility call in 17 minutes and then we can continue this. So brace yourselves.